This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with a wreck and went from there to double murder over 75,000 bucks worth of glitter that nobody got in the end. Because I found out just in time what was fishy about the tale of the mermaid. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Tale of the Mermaid. thirty, I was still in my office, tucking in the loose ends on a report, while I listened with half an ear to the fabric of city sounds rising from the street below. Fabric ripped suddenly by tires clawing concrete. A shattering crash that followed brought me to my feet. It was a traffic accident, and a bad one. I ran to the window, but it had happened around the corner out of sight from my office. So I watched others run for it and remembered grimly that every 30 seconds, somewhere in the country, a thing like that happened. And one out of every 16 minutes was fatal. I wondered who had been chewed up in a chromium meat grinder this time as I listened to first the police, then the emergency ambulance, and finally the scavenger truck cleaned the wreck off the street. After that, I went back to my report again and tried to forget about it. But an hour later, that same accident came back into my office. Mr. Marlowe. Yeah? This is Corey Riggs. Uh, yes, Miss Riggs. I'm a nurse at the Warwick Emergency Hospital. Uh-huh. About an hour ago, a man named Stanley Ott was brought in, and he's been calling for you. For me? He was badly injured in an automobile accident on Coenga on his way to your office. Wait a minute. Who did you say this was? I'm the nurse assigned to Mr. Ott at the hospital. I just got off duty, and I had to wait until I was relieved before I could call you. I see. Well, look, Miss Riggs, I'd like to help in any way I can, but it's 9... 930- Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Ott gave me $250 and told me to call you. Yeah, I know, but And you... he said that I should give you 200 and keep the 50 for myself. Oh, fine. Now I get clients by proxy. I beg your pardon? Nothing. I'll be right over, Miss Riggs. I didn't know anyone named Stanley Ott, and I felt a little like an ambulance chaser, but I was only 15 minutes from getting to the emergency hospital. As I walked up the ambulance ramp, a smart-looking brunette came toward me. I'm Corey Riggs, the nurse who called. Oh, uh, hello. Can I see him now? It wouldn't do any good. You see, um, he went into a coma a few minutes after I called him. Oh, too late, is that it? Let's move away from the door, shall we? Sure. You see, Mr. Marlowe, before he went into the coma, Art wasn't rational. He was raving. About what sort of thing? About you and a girl. Oh? As near as I could make out, she's supposed to meet someone tonight at 2 o'clock and collect $75,000. It's quite an assignment. Who's the girl? I don't know. All I said was something about a, a plaid coat as identification. Plaid coat, huh? Any idea what he wanted me to do? Chaperone, maybe? No, he, he kept pleading, stop her, stop her. She can't do it. So I'm sure that he wanted you to prevent this girl from keeping that appointment. For some reason, it seems absolutely imperative to him. Where was this 2 o'clock meeting supposed to take place? I have no idea. Oh, fine. So it boils down to this. A girl we don't know in a plaid coat is meeting someone we don't know at a place we don't know at 2 a.m. <laughs> the man who wants me to prevent it is in a coma and can't talk. Can he say anything else, Miss Riggs? He just kept saying, you've got to help me, Marlowe. It's life and death. You know, we can stir up an awful hornet's nest poking our noses into 75000 bucks worth of business we know nothing about. I doubt that we can do any good anyway, because we don't have enough to go on. If he said anything else to even point uh, in the right... Marlowe. What? Well, wait a minute. He mumbled something once about a, a Constantine. Constantine? Yes, it's some pier. What is it, a boat? I don't know. But at least it's a lead, isn't it? Mm. Anything else? Mm, no. Okay, where can I reach you? I'll be at my quarters, Crestview 5781. 5781. And keep track of Stanley Ott's condition, will you? If he comes out of it, talk to him. We've only got three short hours. I'll call you, Corey. <laughs> Uh, 
I felt a little weird as I left the hospital because I was traveling on strictly secondhand information as to what had gone on in a delirious mind. But in spite of that, there was still enough coherence in what Corey Riggs told me to make a case. My first stop was a phone booth and a call to the police, where I found out from the accident report that Stan Layout was 30 unmarried small-time lawyer and an L.A. resident with a clean police record. My next call was the harbor master's office in San Pedro. Uh, Constantine? No. Don't remember no vessel by that name, son. Just a minute, I'll look her up in the registry. Uh, let's see. Constana, Constant, Constantine. Only one listed is a four-masted schooner sunk off Pirates Point near Monterey in 1870. A little before my time. Not the one, eh? Not the one. So I tried the Coast Guard. No fishing boat called Constantine on this coast, mister. That was followed by a check of Yacht Harbor at Long Beach, negative. And a call of the pleasure boat anchorage at Santa Monica. No Constantine registered here, sir. And after that, a long, futile reconnaissance of the waterfront from one end to the other. It left me one solid hour later out at the end of a tottering, almost abandoned concessions pier in Venice. Swearing in blind frustration at the black, seething ocean below. I was licked. You ain't thinking of jumping in, are you, Tom? Hey, you look like you lost your best friend. I did, Buster. Me. I was sunk with a Constantine in 1870. Constantine? You know him, too, huh? Him? Yeah. You mean Constantine's a guy? Sure, pal. There's a shack there. Uh, wait till the beacon light comes around uh, again. Uh, you see? See that? Well, yeah. I'll be. <laughs> Prince Constantine Chevnov. Yeah. Occultist, palmist, and medium. Personal consultant by appointment only. Yeah, but uh, that's a fake. No fool. All them guys. Uh, he owes everybody around. He, he, even at the Ziggy. Me. For one buck and, and that's something. But he's a genuine Russian prince. Uh, uh, hey. Hey, where are you going? Have a look. Prince Konstantin Chevnov could be my boy. He wouldn't want you nosing around here, pal. That's too bad. Does he live here? Yeah, in, in the back. He uh, runs his pitch in the front where uh, all them uh, uh, green curtains are. Eh? Uh-huh. Yeah. I suppose he always leaves his door unlocked, huh? Why? What? What? Who? Hey, hey. That's, that's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. There'll be a light switch here someplace. Oh, yeah. Now, let's see what... Oh. Holy oh, catch. Uh, goodbye, mister. Goodbye. As the little wharf rat darted through the door and scampered away into the darkness, I went over to the body, face up on the cheap, gaudy carpet of the seance room. He was about 35 in a substantial gray business suit, stained red in front where the bullets had gone in. His wallet was missing. There was no other identification on him. His gray snap brim hat was spilled a few feet away, so I picked it up to look for initials and found instead a small file card stuck into the sweatband. Typed at the top was the heading, The Mermaid. Owner Otis Van Owen, only relative Evelyn Van Owen, niece. Mermaid stolen November 12, 1948. Insurance paid in full. In ink, Van Owen died August 1949, and under that in pencil... Constantine Chevnov, Venice Pier, and Louis Paradise. 913 Seacrest Road, Pacific Palisades. It took 20 minutes to find 913 Seacrest. And when I stopped and got close enough of what I saw through an open window made the Constantine trap I just left look as reliable as a post office by comparison. It was a miniature Egyptian temple, exotic and dainty, sickening lushness of red velvet and yellow silk. And in the center of the room was a bloated little man balancing a long cigarette holder in one hand while he simpered into a honey-colored French phone in the other. I moved up quietly until I could hear him. A uh, uh, sentimental agreement. <laughs> that is right, Evelyn. Your Uncle Otis and I were the best of friends for years. <laughs> well, thank you, child. Uh, where are you now? Oh, the servitor. Good, good. I advise you to stay there until a few minutes before two and, uh, uh, you uh, will not forget to wear a plaid coat, just to be sure I won't make a mistake. What is it, buddy? What? Side shoe? Oh, 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 careful now. Sudden noises uh, like this gun going off upset, oh, Mr. Paradise. They find so interesting inside. Oh, yeah. Conversation. 
About the mermaid, probably. Uh-oh. I'm glad you dropped that one, bud, because I'd bump you for a nickel to say nothing to 75G. I don't talk things over with punks. I reserve it for the head man. Go do something about it. Okay, bud, I will. Go on, move. Go on to the door inside. If the paradise gets some kind of kick out of stepping on big guys like you. The gopher face Especially shoved his automatic into the small of my back and washed me inside where the air was thick with cheap incense. The bloated little king with a long cigarette holder had stepped out. But he came back fast when the gopher called him. He stared at me from across the room and his nostrils flared for an instant. And he simpered again and sidled toward me. The gopher dug at my spine with his gun. Well, now. What is this, Rudy? Snooper, Mr. Paradise. Caught him outside, peeking in the window. Oh, it is a bad night for snoopers. Who are you? Name's Marlowe. And uh, the business? Snooping. He knows about the mermaid, Mr. Paradise. He does, does he? How much do you know? Speak up. She's got a fishtail instead of legs. You dare to joke. Don't <coughs> you. Stand here and take it, big man. You asked for it. Make a move and I'll drop you. I know what you are, Marlowe, but not how much you have found out. Now tell me, because the next time I slap you, it will carry more weight than my bare hand, I promise. You have company, Paradise. Should I get it? No, you keep this baboon under control, Rudy. I will answer the door. Oh, Prince, come in. Paradise, Paradise, what do you mean? How far do you think you can go with my reputation? Do you want to get me hanged? Wife, what is the matter, Constantine? You are upset. Upset? I'm out of my mind. Oh, what a shock. And such a stupid thing for you to do. What are you raving about? He found that body on his front room floor, right, Constantine? Exactly. Precisely. And what is more, I did not put it there. Of all the places in the world, why did you pick this one? Paradise, who is this? This stranger here? If you would close your mouth and open your eyes more often, Prince Constantine, you would not be the nervous wreck you are. This is Mr. Marlowe, Uh another snooper. Uh, Another one. Paradise. Paradise, listen to me. It's better if we quit. It's better if we don't try it tonight. It's out of hand. I don't like it now. We should get away and come back next year and do it. Ah, you jellyfish, there is nothing to worry about now. Insurance investigators often work in pairs. Is that not so, Marlowe? Your pitch, round man. You don't need any help from me. You are so right. Rudy and I caught the first at your place, Constantine. Nah, right. Now we have the second one sure. here. That is all there are. The danger is over. over. It's clear sailing from yeah, now Yeah, but on. what about that cadaver you had the audacity to leave lying in my sails? Oh, what forgive about that? me, Constantine. Forgive that me, was a necessity. Forgive I am sorry. Now listen. Hey, Rudy. Just go on all the time? Yeah. Ain't it awful? And think of all the champagne, caviar, and bricola, stroganoff you can buy with the mermaid. I don't care. Just a bracelet, but at the same time, it is $75,000 worth of diamonds and platinum. Oh, dada. Oh. Okay, Paradise, I trust you. Now, we go, huh? My, uh, gnazzo. Uh, yes, Prince. Gnazzo it is. Hey, uh, Mr. Paradise. Uh? What should I do with the big boy here? Yeah, you're kind of leaving a loose end around, aren't you, Fatty? I had the time, Marlowe, I would beat the arrogance out of you a little chunk at a time. Rooney. Yeah? You've got no initiative, but you do have imagination. So use it. Goodbye, Marlowe. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... It's a big break in entertainment for you and a big break in a career for some talented youngsters when Horace Heights' original youth opportunity program opens the door to fame and fortune every Sunday evening on CBS. Popular Horace Heights is host to young folks who want to break into show business. And every Sunday evening, one lucky winner does break in to his delight and your listening pleasure. Yes, for music, comedy, thrills, and all-around fun, listen to Horace Heights Sunday evenings. Another great CBS show heard over most of these same stations. Tune in, tune in this fall for the shows that you love best of all. Listen carefully. Here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, 
The Tale of the Mermaid. When Louis Paradise hesitated at the door, snarled the suggestion that this henchman use his imagination in disposing of me, and left in lockstep with the white Russian screwball, I got the point. But even if I'd missed it entirely, one look into Brother Rudy's eyes would have done the trick. There were no pupils, just slits of lethal viciousness. Windows to his warped little mind where I could practically see the montage going on. It ran from ancient thumbscrews by candlelight up to a generous beating by street lamp with brass knucks. I felt a cold knot grow in the pit of my stomach. As Rudy, with a cannon in his hand, pointed at my head, started toward me. And from someplace outside, I got a break. Two romantic cats. Rudy spun toward the sound. One chance to a customer, Rudy, and you miss. Kill you, my lord. Blow your head off. Not tonight, gentle soul. Give it to me. I don't want you to hurt yourself until we've had a chance to talk. That's it. Now, lie down. I knew there was some reason why I like cats, their voices. Okay, Rudy, you've had enough rest. Now, let's get back to business. Now, now wait a minute. Come on, get up. We're going to talk. Wait, hold it, please. No reason for any more rough stuff. I'll cooperate. That's better. Where did Paradise and His Highness head for? The Gnaz, though, where is it? I don't know. Come on, you said there was no reason for rough stuff, remember? Ow! Yeah, yeah, I remember. That Gnaz, though, that's something I never heard of. An unhappy coincidence, Rudy. It's one thing I'm interested in. Hey, wait. Must be something else you want to know. Something else I could tell you that... Hey, hey, what are you going to do? You mean you can't Stay tell, away. Rudy? That's Keep funny. Away. All it... it takes is a little imagination. <laughs> out of the way, I started through the place looking for all important answer to what was the Gnazdo. The 20 minutes of turning drawers and closets inside out revealed nothing more exciting than Louis Paradise's address book, first names only, and a picture of a girl named Toodles who belonged to the Roaring Twenties, and by this time should have caught a death of cold. <laughs> His sister, no doubt. But no lead on the Gnazdo. So on the slim chance that my client Stanley Ott might already be back in this world and able to help, I got outside into my car and drove to the first drugstore where after checking the phone books under everything from bars to bathhouses for a gnazdo and getting no place, I called Corey Riggs at the nurse's home. No, Marlowe. Stanley no. Ott's still unconscious. I just talked to the night nurse on his floor. They expect him to come out of it soon. Uh, why? What happened? Well, it's too much to explain now, Corey, but that girl, the one in the plaid coat, mm -hmm. I found out that her name's Evelyn Van Owen and she's staying at the Surf Hotel. Now, see if that much checks with Art when he comes to, will you? All right. Oh, also, there's a diamond-studded item called the Mermaid, which accounts for that 75000 he mentioned. Now, Constantine and the Pier now equal a phony Russian prince who runs a spook palace out on the old Venice Pier. Now, you got all that? Uh-huh. Good. Now, look, honey, listen real hard. Before Art passed out, did he by any chance say the word Ganazdo? Ganazdo? Yeah. Mm, no, what is it? I don't know. I, I think it's the name of a place. Oh, have you uh, checked the phone book? Yeah, yeah. It's no dice, Corey. Also, I checked one Mr. Louis Paradise, who you might uh, mention. Marlo, Marlo, wait a minute. What's Hold the matter? The wire, will you? There's a girl here, one of the nurses, who's trying to tell me something. Oh. It's the Ganazdo, Marlo. Oh. Shh, wait a minute. She knows something about it here. It's, it's Rosemary. You talk to her. Hello. Hello. You want to know what Gnazdo means? Yeah. Hmm? Well, it's Russian, like Pashlamaya Gnazdo. Oh, that's, uh, well, what does it mean in English, Rosemary? Fast, please, is important. Well, that means let's go to my place. Gnazdo's the word for nest. Sort of like cozy apartment or cottage. My place, nest. You sure of that? Well, I'm positive. I was an army nurse in the war, and I spent two years in Germany after the shooting part was over. Two years, a half a block away from the Russian zone. That's close enough. Thanks a million, Rosemary. I don't mention it. Here's Corey. Oh. That do it, Marlowe? Yeah, I think so. At any rate, unless I'm way off base, it's where both the mermaid and all parties concerned are going to rendezvous at 2 a.m. That's less than a half hour from now. The prince's place on the pier. I want to be early, so goodbye, Corey. I'll call again when I know more. Yeah, and give my everlasting love to girlfriend Rosemary. She all is show a peace. There was still a few parts missing, the way there always are. As I drove fast for the old Venice Pier and added as I went along, it came out something like the 
team of Paradise and Prince Whatchamacallit ready, willing, and able to pay 75 grand for a piece of jewelry that one Evelyn Van Owen now owns. A mermaid, which according to the data I'd found on the insurance man's body, had once been stolen from Evelyn's late uncle. But I left it there when my rearview mirror said a long gray sedan that had been tagging me discreetly for the last three blocks. Now being indelicate about it and closing fast. The driver was old pal Rudy, and as he came abreast, he headed for me. All right, all right. You're okay. You're okay, Mac. Don't you worry about a thing. We'll have you out of there in a minute. Ed. Hey, can't you knock up that horn? I knocked out the horn and said... What do you think we're trying I'm to do? It ain't so easy to get in my hand past this frigid hood. You yeah. know? Oh. Oh. Well, that's better. Hey. Hey, cabby, what'd I hit? Well, in order of our appearance, Ooh. Mac, your car into a telephone pole, and then you into your dashboard. Oh, yeah, you're sure lucky you bounced off the car first, Mr. Slowed you down plenty. Oh, hey, here comes the ambulance. Yeah. Look at the roll. Not for me. I'm all right. Hey, come on, Cabby. Help me out of this, will you? Sure, sure. That's what we're trying to do. But uh, don't you worry. The ambulance ain't for you. For the guy that sideswiped you and then tried to get away. I seen what happened, and I went after him in my cab. <laughs> he turned into a dead end, no less, trying to shake me. Ooh, is he a mess. But I guess he'll live all right. Hey, what you got against you, anyhow, Mac? Just my life. Listen, your cab's still all right? Sure. There's some place you got to go? There is. The old Venice Concessions Pier, my friend, and the sooner the better. Come on. Maybe my head against the dashboard was exactly what I needed. Because right then and there, the method of Rudy's handiwork made me think of an angle that I'd neglected almost completely. My unconscious client had not wanted me to get the mermaid or the 75,000 bucks, but to stop Evelyn from keeping her rendezvous, which at this point I figured could mean but one thing. It was exactly 2 o'clock when the cab slammed to a stop near the pier. I piled out and ran onto the empty, fog damp and flanking that led to Prince Constantine's shack. Nothing but mist moved over the pier. No unusual sound broke the pattern of waterfront noises. But I thought momentarily that I was still in time to prevent what Stanley out somehow knew was going to happen. That Louis Paradise and his eccentric sidekick intended to get the mermaid from Evelyn, but pay off in only one... <laughs> one way. to the rear of the shack on stilts and got close to the half-open door where I could see and hear and found out just what I'd expected. And the storeroom spread out and very still on the oil-soaked planks that were a makeshift floor with the lifeless form of a girl who, according to the plaid coat she wore, was the late Evelyn Van Owen. And kneeling close to a gun in one hand, the sparkling mermaid in the other, was her execution on Louis Paradise. Next to him is number one boy, Prince Constantine Chevnov. Not very happy. A fool, a fool to shoot her was stupid. Yes. Seventy-five grand, stupid. Uh, or would you have preferred that I pay Miss Van Owen in cash? I had to kill her. Yes, 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 paradise, but the gun, so much noise, we can't afford to attract attention. There's two cops is on hand, I should say not, uh, Prissy. Don't try it, Louis. Uh, the mermaid... Space between the boards. You made it. Oh. It's in the water, Chevnov. Shame. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's a shame. We did so much. Worked so hard. Yeah. Killed so often. And a run for it, Your Highness? Run? No. No. Paradise is dead there. Without paradise, I. I am not so brave. I will do as you say. Keep quiet. Don't make a sound, Chef. No, we got company. Quiet! Pardon me, Mr. Chef. Can you please tell me where Louis Paradise can be found? That's Louis Paradise there. Who are you? Evelyn Van Owen. What? Van Owen? The woman who was supposed to sell the mermaid to Paradise? That's right. But on my way over here, just after I left my hotel, somebody struck me, knocked me out took my, my coat there and, and my purse and ran. Your purse with a mermaid, no doubt. Yes. And that, Miss Van Owen, makes this angle shooter here. Yeah. The very dead nurse, Corey Riggs. <laughs> Let's get out of here. <laughs> Stanley's going to be all right. Oh, I'm so 
happy. <laughs> Why is it women always cry when they're so happy? You know? I don't know, but it's effective. Well, I'll run along now. Goodbye. Bye, Doctor. Bye. You know, Mr. Marlowe, when I was in Stanley's room with the doctor, Stan said he didn't lose control of his car at all when he had that accident in front of your place. He was run off the road by... By a gray sedan, I know, because I had the same treatment. It's one of Louis Paradise's henchmen, Rudy. Where's your car, honey? I'll walk you out. Just outside the front door. Mm -hmm. Tell me, did I tell you why Rudy roughed him up? Yes, in a way. You see, I told Stanley about the deal with the mermaid, and he thought it all sounded a little phony. Can't understand why. He's a lawyer, you know. A legal type mind, yeah. Uh, He said meeting anyone at two in the morning was ridiculous, so he investigated as much as he could because he was worried about me. We're engaged, you know. No, I never would have guessed. And and he found out that Mr. Paradise was a fence. And Stan said that probably he never intended to give me the $75,000 for the mermaid at all. That they they intended to kill me. Mm, Here we are. Tell me, why did you get in touch with Paradise in the first place? I was just following Uncle Otis's instructions. Mm -hmm. He gave me the mermaid when he was dying. And he told me if I wanted money to sell it only to a Mr. Paradise, but but not to mention it to anyone. Your uncle faked a robbery, collected the insurance money, and then let you sell the mermaid to a fence, huh? It's lucky for you that Nurse Corey Riggs was clever. She put together just enough of Otis's gibberish to know that there was something good to be had and then got me to unravel it for her. She got killed taking my place. When she tried to collect your 75,000 bucks. Yeah. Oh, here's my car. Well, Evelyn, for a little while you were a rich woman. Now it's all gone. How do you feel? Well, I'm alive and in love. Yes, well, that answers my question. Good night, baby, and good luck. When I left the hospital, I wandered back to the old Venice Pier in Prince Constantine's Gnazdo. It was five in the morning, and the police had finished cleaning the place up. But the word had gotten out. A crowd had gathered. They always do. Curious, restless, sordid crowd, equipped with everything from grappling hooks to homemade diving helmets, all climbing over each other for a chance to fish for the mermaid. She would brought death to three people, injury to two others in the course of one night. And suppose they found her. What then? A lot of glittering pieces of white coal set in a metal frame we call precious. Look at the sucker's grab. That's all, Marlowe. Home and to bed. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Rita Lynn, John Daner, Michael Ann Barrett, Wilms Herbert, Junius Matthews, Herb Bygren, and Mark Lawrence. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with a terrified woman lost in a maze of memories she couldn't explain. And waiting for her outside an open window was death. Another show has joined the CBS Sunday Night Parade. It's the Contented Hour, starring Buddy Clark and featuring the finest in popular and semi-classical music. It comes to you on most of these CBS stations for the first time tomorrow night, making its debut on CBS the same night as Red Skelton and Edgar Bergen and Charles McCarthy. Yes, this fall, you hear them all on CBS. This is Paul Masterson speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.